Okay, good morning from San Diego, everybody. This is Pete Spain, and here we have a uh, bright, sunny, blue sky day. Just the correct setting for Paul Devine's exciting presentation about deciphering data. There's nothing Paul loves more than fiddling with his ADCP data, and that connection has a long history. Paul is now entering his 21st year at RD Instruments. We'll have a little chat with Paul in a minute. And uh, while I'm chatting with him, I'm going to launch a poll, give us some idea about the scope of experience people have with working with ADCPs. We know we have listeners from all around the world, including people in India who are eight o'clock at night. So thank you. So Paul, welcome. Thanks, Pete. I'm glad I to be here. You have a uh, master's degree in coastal engineering from University of Florida. Go Gators. Go Gators. So what is it that uh, led you to choose a coastal focus for your training? I wanted to uh, I wanted to save the world. I wanted to design uh, wave energy converters and I, I love surfing and playing in the sand and I wanted to save the world. So that, that's why I chose that's why I chose to study the ocean. I see. So you must have watched a lot of Superman movies when you were a young guy then. <laughs> yeah. So Let's go real fast. One of one of the things that we know about you is you were raised on the East Coast and came to California about 20 years ago, a little more, because you had a job in uh, on the West Coast before RDI. So what brought you to the West Coast? I had the option at the time of taking a job in Jacksonville, Florida, doing just sediment beach beach management or taking a job in Long Beach and doing more international, more a wider variety of studies um, for a larger firm that worked all over the world. Um, I actually got for the the Dubai, uh, the 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 world, the Palm, put it across my desk uh, as a feasibility study back before back when it was just really just a sketch on a napkin. The question was, hey, what do you think about this? You know, what, what should we recommend to these people that want to put this island offshore, Dubai? You know, it was yeah. Gonna, what did that company do, Paul? You haven't told us what they did. They did coastal engineering, but they did oh, more. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they did more large infrastructure, you know, more large civil engineering development bridges. And, you know, it was more than just more than just beaches. So I thought that was a better a better avenue for me to eventually do a wave energy converter. <laughs> okay, and then so to today's topic, um, what's the most interesting data set you've seen, and why did you find it compelling? Actually, the the, the data set that we are going to review today was. Uh, was 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 it's 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 an interesting data set because it is so regular you know you can really see the heartbeat of the ocean with the tides and there's a really phenomenal anomaly right in the middle where where it's it's cool to kind of delve in and see why the ocean skipped a beat you know very good so what i'll do is i'll close the poll and you can see it's an interesting breakdown <clears throat> 50 40 and 10 essentially so thank you for telling us all about yourselves. I can see we've got 40 attendees at this point. Very good. So okay. a couple of um, housekeeping matters. There's a chat room down there. If people would like to uh, submit questions during the presentation, please put them in there. We'll have a more extended interactive Q and question and answer session after Paul finishes his presentation. And we'll also have a couple more questions towards the end in another poll or Two. So, Paul, let me hand you the microphone over to you. Thanks, Pete. So, uh, wait. Okay, what we're going to be talking about today is ADCP data QA and how to how to how to verify that your ADCP data is, is valid before you go publish a report. And and I wanted to mention some of the these concepts apply to all of our ADCPs. The high frequency the Sentinel-V ADCPs, short range, the Pinnacle ADCP, the long range system, 
and then also the the DVLs if you, you, the new Tasman DVL that Pete's going to talk about next week the phased array system um, is you can turn on current profiling and turn it into an ADCP also same concepts apply for the channel masters for open channel flow monitoring or the river pro the different vertical moving boat river systems that, that give you river discharge that river discharge value is made up of the raw ADCP velocity data. Pete actually gave me this, this slide uh, when we were planning this webinar and I said, well, what are you actually going to talk about? Well, um, we're not going to, we're not going to talk about choosing your right questions and collecting your data because you've already done that. You have the data set now. What we want to do is inspect the data set, check out your data, clean it up before you export it and make your displays, your charts, your analysis, and write your final data report. So we're really talking here about the inspection of your data set after you've already collected it. And um, also stealing this slide from Pete as well. Um, this is a, if, if, if this is a, a time series of ADCP profile data from surface to bottom or from bottom to surface in the vertical, how do things vary in time? How do things evolve? Like here's a, here's a, here's an anomaly at depth. You know, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a, um, a, a what we say is a clump, <laughs> you know, that we see the pattern change over time in the horizon, in the, in, in the, the X axis, which is time. And there's this big clump. I don't see any gaps, but there are these low valleys here. How symmetric is it? How, how does it vary over time with the tides? And um, how does it vary also in the vertical from top to bottom? You know, you see this, this anomaly at depth. What, what's going on here? You know, how does, how does that vertical structure change in time when the, when the, when the anomaly goes away? Pete, you got anything to add if you're, uh, we're good? Yeah, carry on, Paul. Okay. So <clears throat> what can the ADCP tell you, right? Um, you see uh, this Venn, Venn diagram so shows you that we've got information about the ADCP in the deployment. What was its heading, tilt, pressure, temperature, right? Where, what was it, where was it within the water column and how was it oriented? And then you've got about the data quality, right? You've got the correlation parameter, percent good, signal strength, um, and then you've got about the water and the environment. You've got the current, right? So that's that's really what you're interested in, is how how good is my current velocity data? Um, we're not going to get into bottom tracking today. We're the the data set that we have today is self-contained, non-moving, bottom mounted. But these 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 are uh, these um, these same concepts apply to moving boat surveys as well. When you're moving the ADCP through space and time. Um, okay. So the data set that we we're going to be looking at today is from New York. Here's the the Freedom Tower. Um, I guess you know I should mention at this time I know that it's it's a pretty difficult time for all of us right now, um, especially for those in New York in the United States and other other areas around the world. Um, pretty hard hit. We seem to be pretty lucky in California, but uh, I know that it's been a very difficult time for the people in New York. Um, but this data set is from uh, just just right near the Veranzano Narrows Bridge. So location, right? So this is Manhattan. This is New Jersey. Hey, this is where I'm from. How you doing, huh? Um, this is New York, New Jersey. Uh, this is one of the biggest ports. I think the third largest port in the United States is the New York, you know, the New York Harbor Complex, including Elizabeth, New Jersey. In order to get in here, you come in from the ocean, you you cruise past the Verrazano Narrows and turn left, and now you're in the port. So um, a lot of traffic passes underneath the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And um, here is the data set from the Verrazano Narrows. This is a 30-day time series of velocity from an ADCP. Um, this is water speed. And we're looking up 
at the surface, we see the surface and we see the velocities. Um, at this point right here, we see red is high, green is, and, and red is uh, 1.5 meters per second. So we have a period here where really high velocity extending all the way to the bottom. Earlier in the data set, we see, you know, the, the currents at the bottom are much less than the currents at the surface. And then we see periods later in the data set where they're even higher, you know, exceeding 1.5 meters per second. Um, this is a time series of water level. So we see at this site, because it's at the mouth of the Hudson River, um, there is riverine input. So this is, if I take a step back, this is the, the Hudson River that runs on the, along the west side of Manhattan. So there is some freshwater outflow through this tidal inlet. You see the variation of the tides. So this is a high water period, a low water period. I should mention, I, uh, this is a full 30 days, a full you know month of data from a system that was actually cabled and out sending data real time to the ports, to the port pilots. Um, this is a temperature, you know, water temperature. Um, it was, this period was December um, 1st, 2003. So we're, we are reaching back into the archives a little bit to uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve, when all the Times Square is going nuts at 11.57 p.m. And uh, we... We see, um, again, water level variation. You see the tides superimposed on the, the riverine. You know, we see the, the pulses of high tide elevation when there's riverine flow. Um, and we have this next plot is red is depth averaged current speed and blue is depth averaged current direction. And you see the, the pulsing of the tides. Um, 300 degrees is to the north and 150 degree northwest and 150 degrees is to the southeast. So you see the tides coming in and out of the harbor, varying in speed. So here's, here's a pulse of relatively high speed followed by a, a hiccup in the current direct, the depth average current direction. So here something happened where the tides were arrested by something. I mean, the, you know, so it's a, uh, so we're going to look a little bit deeper into this data set. Uh, by the way, pitch and roll is the last slide. And uh, we can see that the ADCP has one degree of pitch or one degree of roll and three degrees of pitch. So this thing is for all intensive purposes, vertically in the water column. First question we ask normally is, uh, how much pitch and roll do we see? Um, you know, where where is my ADCP pointed? And and we verified what by looking at the pitch and roll data that we're looking up or that we're 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 not on our side, which is always a bad thing. Paul, Unless before you go on, do you want to say something about the swing in water depth on that second panel? Yeah. So here. Right here? Yeah. Well, no, the whole, what, 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 what's the information that's available in terms of changing water level in that display? Well, it, 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 it's, it's oscillating. So this is a, this is a one day or this is seven days of time. So we see the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We see the two highs and two lows per day of the tidal exchange and then it's modulated it's not like you'd see uh from a from a tidal prediction where these are consistent and the and the mean water level isn't changing you see if you run a running mean through here this is this is a period of exceptionally low water that doesn't appear to be from the tide something else went on here i mean is, is that i guess i'm not ex exactly understanding your question pete but is that yeah over you know, there near um 22 you can see the uh -huh. swing is uh two meters in water depth from peak to trough oh this is meaning the tidal range yes yeah excuse me yes so uh, the y-axis on tidal range or a water depth is from 28 this this one grade or these two gradations here is one meter so this total this total tidal elevation change is from 20 
eight and a half to 27 and a half or 20, 26 and a half. So it's, yeah, it's about two meters range. Okay. So what we're going to do now is zoom in on this hatched region, this three day or this, you know, two and a half, three day long hatched region. So I've zoomed in now from, um, you know, December 10th to December 30th or 13th. I'm sorry. We're looking at a three day time period. So we're seeing one, two, three, four, five, six high tides and one, two, three, four, five, six low tides. There's seven if you include this one. Um, and we see the current speed, depth average current speed, again in red, getting up over a meter per second. And then the depth average current direction going from 325 to the northwest and then uh, 150 to the southeast. And we see this period here where the water was elevated, the water level was elevated significantly for the, the low tide um, at 28 and a half meters. And then the very next low tide was up at 27 and a half meters. <clears throat> so, um, oh, whoa, oh, whoa, oh, excuse me. So what I'm, this is that same three day period. And what I'm displaying here is water speed and water direction. So from, from vertical range from the ADCP, this is range to the surface. Uh, we see red is going to the north and blue is going to the south. And if we, if we zoom in here on this period where it's going to the north, we're seeing this is the vertical variation in the current speed. And you see how the currents are going to the north, the direction relative to the compass rose is to the north. And we see the current speeds are actually highest midwater column here. You see that pulse of higher velocity in the middle of the water column, lower velocity at the surface, lower velocity at the bottom. And then during this period, we see significantly high velocity at the surface, red water speed, greater than a meter per second at the surface, and then higher, closer to half a meter per second at the bottom. But in the middle, we've got a dip, right? We've got high at the, high at the surface, high at the bottom all going ebbing out to sea. So blue is towards the ocean, red is up the Hudson. And then during this period, we see uh, uh, a pretty abrupt shear where it's going out to sea, ebbing on the surface and upstream at the bottom. We see that here in this profile, out to sea at the surface, upstream at the bottom, these color contours in these plots, blue is low velocity, red is high velocity. And then after this event, you know, after this event occurs, the, during the next tidal cycle where it should be going out to sea, we see extremely strong velocities out to sea. And then with, a, with an odd profile, it's where it's really, um, uh, I don't wanna say retarded, but reduced velocity at the bottom. This isn't a, this is not a classic, riverine logarithmic profile needless to say right you've got you've got this uh this this density interface that's coming in from the salt water at the bottom or the denser salt water at the bottom if you look at this uh if you look at the time right in the x-axis where the currents are going upstream they're actually a longer duration at the bottom than they are at the surface so we're seeing like a net you know what we can what we can infer from this is is a, is a net upstream flow at the bottom and a net downstream flow at the surface. But this particular event where the where the ocean skipped its beat, you know, where the ocean changed its 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 cadence with the tides, where we saw significant riverine flow or out to sea at the surface, uh, is what we're going to look at in detail. Look at the ADCP data quality parameters. So thus far, we've really looked at orientation of the ADCP and speed and direction, you know, vector velocity vectors. We, we haven't really looked at the drilled down into the ADCP data quality parameters. And we want to know, is this, is this reasonable data? Is this a, is this a thumbs up where I've captured this, this event where the ocean, you know, skips a beat at the surface? Is it good or bad? A thumbs up or thumbs down? 
So RDA's data quality indicators. Um, we've got error velocity, which is actually the overall quality of the process data. Um, it, it's what is my, you know, can I believe this velocity vector? If you had error velocity data, if you, if you had only one parameter to use, you'd use error velocity. And what we would recommend is that when you plan your deployment, you get an expected standard deviation in velocity. Your errors in your data set should be less than five times expected standard deviation. And when we look at the data, we look when we evaluate the error velocity, I'm gonna set five times error as red. And then correlation is the, the information content in the signal. How, um, you know, how, how good was our, you know, how much information was there in the return that we received before we calculated the velocity? And it's um, normally in the instrument, we flag it bad at 64 and perfect is 128. And then echo intensity is the strength of the return. You know, what, how strong was the, the, the acoustic return we got off the particles in the water? And it's proportional to sediments and zooplankton and bubbles and anything that causes a, a change in the amount of echo we get back from the return or from the water column shows up as a change in echo intensity. Right. So here's that three day period again, and um, blue is out to sea, red is upstream. Here's the, we've zoomed in. Here's a, here's a plot of error, correlation, and intensity. And what do we see? We see, um, we see errors. Our predicted standard deviation for this setup was about a centimeter per second. So I flag red is five times that. And we see anomalies here in error. So these are all questionable, questionable velocity data. But we don't see a, a, a large anomaly, a large blob, a large um, high elevated errors during this period. So initial indication is things look good. Um, correlation is, again, the, the, the information, almost the, the signal to noise in our measurement. Um, and perfect correlation is 128. And we're seeing very good correlation. This is the average across all four beams. We're seeing good correlation up at 128 counts. Uh, right at the very start, we're seeing a reduced correlation, but still well below our, 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 our threshold of where we would call it bad of 64 counts. And in the intensity, we're, we're seeing these, in the signal strength, right? We're seeing these stripes in signal, increased signal is high, uh, blue is low, and you see higher signal strength at the bottom, and then you see a decreasing signal strength, and then an increase right at the surface. This is the this is the signal. This is the we always see a, a significant increase in signal strength right at the very surface because the surface is a really good acoustic reflector. But we see these we see an anomaly in error, correlation, and signal strength. So maybe for these individual profiles, you may want to flag these as questionable, right? But during this period that we saw where the where the ocean skipped a beat, it appears to be be good. These other stripes, I believe, are passing ships because this is such a well-traveled waterway. I think it's it's safe to assume that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen. 16 ships sailed into New York Harbor in three days. I think that's a, definitely a reasonable assumption. You know, these are container ships. The, the reason that this these these ADCPs were deployed were to provide some real-time data to the port pilots. And <clears throat> you can see an anomaly from that passing ship. The assumption is that that's a passing ship. Anything to add, Pete? Yeah, a couple of things, Paul. Those would yeah. be bubbles that are being created by the passing ships. So the bubble bubbles. cloud that's generated by the wash of the ship is, or the propeller of the ship, is that's what you're seeing in the echo data. Yes, yes. The bubbles. other thing you can see in the direction data, down at the, the, the bottom, you can see the tide is turning first when it's flooding, going and it's going into orange. It turns first at the bottom. 
Correct. And yes. yet there's an asymmetry in that it's that when the tide begins to ebb, it's the same top to bottom in the direction data. So it, it first turns on the on the incoming tide, it first turns and comes in at the bottom and passes to the surface as the tide fully starts to flood. And then on the ebb, it abruptly it, it, it's more abrupt in time. Yep, an observation. You haven't mentioned the cause of the event. It was likely a storm, I take it, based on what the currents are doing. Yeah, and 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 you know, um, on December, on December sixth, uh, I looked back at the weather record. There was a huge blizzard on December sixth and seventh that dumped a bunch of snow in the city, and. During this period, there was a strong northwest wind that blew straight down the Hudson, blew all of the water out to sea. So I think that it was a combination of the northwest wind and the snow melt when the storm, you know, the and when when it when it when the when the, when the rainstorm came <laughs> and melted the snow and. All Big slug of fresh water running out to sea, arresting the tides. Thank you. Yeah. So again, echo intensity, it's the return strength that reveals sediment and like Pete said, bubbles due to the passing ships, zooplankton, um, anomalies. Uh, um, if you if you have a failing beam, if if your ADCP is starting to starting to uh Starting to fail, you'll see an anomaly in the echo, intense, echo intensity. You'll also see interference from structures if you've mounted too close to a bridge pile. Uh, and we're seeing acoustically seeing return from the bridge or the oil rig or the, you know, the, the bottom platform you've mounted it in or an external, external sonar. Um, so fish passing ships. Um, and then just to note that we have the echo intensity data on all four of the beams. So it's not that what I was displaying before is was a was an averaged echo intensity. So you could see differences amongst the beams. And there's a natural there is a slight natural variation in the in the or not natural but we have a manufacturing tolerance for the allowable difference in echo intensity between the beams and this this is a, a normal variation from beam to beam to beam. But I've kind of zoomed in. I've now made red um, instead of 180 counts of echo uh, to 150, and we could see these these stripes due to the passing. What I what I'm assuming is passing vessels are much more significant. And then this this blue line here is the anomaly, and we do see a significant increase in the echo intensity before this event occurs, you know, right at this changing of the tide. And this is when the wind picked up, and this is an increase in surface, in bubbles at the surface due to the, I, I believe, the white capping waves from the from the wind event. I look back at the wind data, and this is, this is like a 30 knot wind blowing down the river. So I think these are, uh, these are wind waves. This ADCP wasn't set up to uh, measure waves, by the way. Okay, correlation, again, it's the information content in the signal. It's, it's proportional to signal to noise. 128 counts of correlation is perfect, and 64 counts would normally flag it as bad, as default. And causes of low correlation are turbulence, and then kind of weaker returns where your signal to noise decreases right at the end of the profiling range. Um, it's not mentioned here. We also see some anomalies in correlation right at the very surface due to side lobe interference. We're, we're you know, the, the ADCB can't measure all of the way to the surface, and you do see anomalies in the correlation as you get too close to the surface. Um, this is correlation. Again, it's for all four beams. So we're seeing a similar signature. When that vessel came by, we saw the bubbles in all four beams. And we don't see an anomaly in the correlation during this event. So, and then error. Um, this is a previous generation workhorse ADCP that doesn't have the fifth vertical beam, but that's that's what was deployed at this site. Um, the assumption is that all four of the beams see the same water flow, and when they don't, when you have 
in, homo in homogeneous flow that you'll see an increase in error. And, and by the way, the, the, the assumption of flow homogeneity is the uh, second assumption of the ABCP, and the error velocity verifies that assumption. And we scale our error velocity to be equivalent to the predicted measurement standard deviation. And it provides really the most sensitive screen for data quality. You know, we looked previously at echo and correlation. We could have just really looked at error and, be done, and been done with it. But um, the three data quality parameters all go in conjunction. They all work it together in conjunction. But uh, the error is the most sensitive screen for data quality. And in the instrument firmware, uh, with a workhorse or in the next generation systems that don't average in the instruments, um, you can use the error to screen each individual ping for unacceptable noise. Did a fish, if you see a fish or, or exceedingly large turbulence or eddies, um, you'll see an increase in, uh, an increase in the error above what we would predict. Um, <clears throat> and Error if you have a consistent obstruction from a solid scatter, like a wall, a, a break wall, or a pier pile, or a passing, uh, or a, 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 a yeah, a, something that stays in the beam, it's going to cause a very consistent bias in the data. You'll see an error, increase in the error. So, error, we're just going to look just at error only, and we see. Uh, we see during this period where the where the tides skip the beat, um, we see uh, no uh, er anomalies in error. We do just before, and these are elevated, but still within our acceptable range. And right here at this at this in depth middle middle mid water column, we see elevated error, but really there's just relatively infrequent occurrences of these high errors which can be easily screened out in the software. So again, error, no anomaly, correlations are, are, are valid, intensities, I don't see any anomalies in the intensities. This is, by evaluating these three, these three uh, data quality parameters, error, correlation, and signal strength, echo, we can trust that this anomaly, we captured this, this storm event where um, the Hudson River ebbed for, um, you know, it, it, it missed a flood cycle at the very surface. Good quality data. Thumbs oh, up. I'll just go back for a sec. Yeah. Look in the, you can see, say, at the uh, about 12 and a half, there's a very uh -huh. high correlation between the pattern in the direction. So you've got the the bilayer, the two layer flow, and then right. right below that you can see a, a blue stripe. And so that's going to be the uh, the mixing associated with the shear at the interface. So that's turbulence okay. that you can see in that data. Yeah, this is turbulence and mixing right there. You do see an anomaly in the correlation. You see a reduction in the correlation as well because of that turbulence and mixing. And then you see an increase in the in intensity as well as as sediments getting kicked off the bottom. So this is, in, you know, increased sediment transport due to this mixing and turbulence. Well, I don't know for sure that it's mixing, uh, coming off the bottom, but we see an increase in intensity as well at this region. Yeah, there's a lot of information in the correlation. Um, that's what I've heard from people that are looking at, at mixing and, and turbulence. Okay, so um, I... I figured it would be good to mention at this point, um, www.drpeets.com uh, is Pete Spain's website, and he's got a ton of case studies listed there. And uh, I think this one is, there's one that uh, talks specifically about ADCPs measuring the weekly transects across the Gulf Stream and how, um, I don't know if any of you saw the day after tomorrow movie where New York froze and the Gulf Stream shut down. Um, the the eighty the vessel mounted ADCPs have been used to measure the health of the Gulf Stream for the past 25 years um, on vessel mounted you know on on a container ship that's going from New York to Bermuda. Um, it's it's a it's a great case study, kind of related to New York 
because the the ship leaves from New York Harbor, and it also uh, I don't. Pete, did you, did you see the day after tomorrow when the when when New York froze because the Gulf Stream shut down and no, it was it's a disaster movie that that uh, you know is debunked by the 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 ADCP measure the ADCP the the conclusion of this study or recent or that one of the con one of the conclusions from the study that the the Gulf Stream has not reduced its transport transporting heat from the Gulf Stream from the equator to the the North Pole or from the northern northern latitudes so we're not uh, the Gulf Stream is not apparently not shutting down and uh, May 27th Pete Spain is going to be talking about our phased array transducers so uh, 10 a.m. Eastern a little bit earlier um, but uh, then today, but uh, next was this Wednesday, May 27th. Is that right, Pete? Wednesday? Next Wednesday. That's We're, it. Uh, next Wednesday. Yep. So you all should show up tomorrow to learn about the power of the phased array transducers for these DVLs that can also become ADCPs. And if you need to contact me, I am paul.divine at tele, teleedine.com, 858-254. 7204 is my mobile phone that I answer as I'm home trying to shelter in place. So thank you very much. Um, Pete, okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put up this poll. One of the questions that I uh, was asking before we started was to the audience, would you like to see more presentations where we're talking about how to work with data? And um, there's various topics we could we present where we'd, we'd give you if, uh, ideas about how to go in and explore a data set, but we'd like to know that people are really looking for the this type of presentation. If you could just let us know on this poll, that would be great. So, Paul, uh, you mentioned the the currents and the water level, and also that the ADCPs can do waves. So essentially, you've got this one device now that can measure all aspects that are of interest to physical oceanographers. I mean, do you want to say something about that from the point of view of a, a coastal engineer? How does this tool help? Coastal engineers. Yeah, I mean, if you, you you can get design criteria for a device or a structure you're building, you know, you, you, the currents that are that are trying to topple it, the currents and waves that are trying to push it over or scour it out. So if you're if you're designing a, a breakwater, you need to know flow, velocity, waves, or pier. I mean, it's it's a it's it's a tool that should be in every engineer's toolbox, and we should all feel going into the ocean and collecting data with it because it's it is relatively easy now to, to get quality data from the ocean using an adcp and commercially available deployment platforms and acoustic releases and you know you don't even have to use a diver anymore to get them in the water because the shallow water acoustic releases are so reliable not only that with the currents you know whether the diver is going to be swept away <laughs> yeah right you can measure the currents before you put the diver in the water Thank you for your feedback about whether you'd like more. It seems like 96% of uh, people who answered would like to see more webinars on uh, working with data. So we'll have to work on that. And one yeah. final poll, please let us know how whether you're uh, very excited that you spent the last 40 minutes with us. Yeah, we so, do thank Paul, you for your time and I hope to see you again. All right. Or hope all to. Right. Thank you. Are there any questions before we go for uh, Paul? I'm opening up the, maybe Paul. Okay, I'm opening the microphone for everybody if you'd like to ask a question. All righty, looks like, oh, there we go. That's now it should be. If there's anybody with a question, you could speak up. All right, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Great start to the day. And hopefully I'll see some of you next week. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye now.